remain standing, take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 15. Thank you, Pastor Alex. Thank you, Brother Toby. Thank you, Hannah and team. Acts chapter 15, if you will, and then we will go to 2 Timothy, which is on page 825 in my Bible. Are you ready? All right. Let's read the word of the Lord. Acts chapter 15, find verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we've preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with him John called Mark, but Paul insisted they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they departed from one another, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And they went through Syria and Cecilia, Strengthening the churches. Turn now to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and uh, just one verse, verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for the ministry. Wow, something happened, because it's the same guy. So the Apostle Paul, who refused to take John Mark, now wants him to come. Father, tonight, I pray, move in great power. May we never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I guess there's a new version of Beauty and the Beast. Is that right? A lot of controversy about that because of the pushing of the homosexual agenda and the open declaration by uh, the producers from Disney. There's all kinds of people that are uh, opposing, of course, and, and even boycotting. But there's tremendous beauty in the story of Beauty and the Beast. You say, well, what, what is it? Beauty and the Beast to me, is always a picture. It's a picture since I've been saved these past couple decades. It's a picture of me, of the beast, who's just like all of us, selfish, under a curse, and somehow ends up getting the kiss, you know, the, the transformation, and becomes, you know, the handsome king and priest, uh, prince. I don't know the whole story. I haven't seen the movie in years, but it's, it, it's a picture to me of the gospel. It's a picture of me of all of us are like beasts. All of us have issues. We're all got problems. We're all ugly. You ugly. You ugly. Amen. But Jesus takes your ugliness and he'll transform you if you let him. And you'll become the prince that he's intended you to be. The Lord will transform you. Come on, say, God's transforming me. Go ahead, say that. The Lord will transform you if you will let Him. And I have found that many people actually don't go fully through the transformation process because it can be kind of painful. Let's look at this text. There's a number of people here in the story. There's Paul, there's Barnabas, there's Silas, and there's this gentleman by the name of Mark. He's a young lad. 
Mark is the son of Mary, to give you some background, and we do have notes tonight. Mark is the son of Mary, a well-to-do lady in Jerusalem, whose house was a place of, uh, of meeting for the early church, and there was other locations also. In fact, it is said that the upper room was probably his house, Mary's house, John Mark. Secondly, Mark was a nephew of Barnabas. They were related. Barnabas, the son of encouragement. That's what Barnabas means. Barnabas was related to, to Mark. How many of you knew that? He's related to him. And uh, Mark, the nephew of Barnabas, went with Paul earlier on. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 12. And what's interesting is that as they go on this journey... Something happens in the middle of the journey, and we don't know exactly what it is. Many have speculated that it's this encounter with this bar Jesus guy. There's a man who's perverted and demonized, and Paul says to him, and you can read, I believe it's Acts 13, you can go and look, and he says, how long will you pervert the ways of the Lord now you're going to grope around in darkness. And this mist comes over this guy and he becomes blind and he gropes around. He, he has a, a, a level of judgment comes on him because he was trying to keep the, the pro council from being saved. And, and many have said that it was at that moment, that supernatural encounter of darkness and light and the power of God bringing judgment on this bar Jesus guy and that event causing this young man to turn heel and run. Has anybody ever been scared? Not I mean your average kind of scared. I mean like really scared. It was an event like that. And I think the thing that's amazing to me is this young man that we're talking about, John Mark, he, he was with Jesus. He was with Jesus when they fed the 5,000. He was with Jesus when they fed the 4,000. He was with Jesus during the walk of the Lord when Jesus walked the earth. He was there. The three years of Jesus' earthly ministry, John, Mark, was there. And I think it's amazing to me because there's probably nobody better, I would say, nobody could preach better than Jesus. Would that be fair to say? I don't care who your favorite preacher is. I'd say Jesus is probably better. You said, oh, I just love T.D. Jakes. Oh, yeah, T.D. Jakes can take like Jesus wept and blow it up into this thing where everybody gets saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. It's just amazing. Jesus preaches better than T.D. Jakes. He preached better than, than, than Billy Graham. He's the, he's the original preacher. And so John Mark, we know, was attending those meetings with Jesus, and yet he sees this supernatural event, possibly. There is some speculation, so we don't know for sure. But we do know that he abandoned the missions team. Now, we've taken lots of missions trips, and I'll just tell you, you're not allowed to abandon the missions team. There have been, on some rare occasions, people have gotten sick and had to go home early. I mean, that's understandable. But someone who just gets scared and leaves and goes home, how many of you know that we're probably going to make sure that that doesn't happen for the next missions trip? How many of you think that'd be a good idea that if you had somebody on the team and they quit, you'd want to make sure that they're not at that place next time? Right? It's like we're playing sports. Anybody ever play sports? I used to, I used to paddle uh, the outrigger canoes in Hawaii. And there was this one team. These guys were bad to the bone. I mean, amazing athletes. And they were, they were scheduled to win the, the iron. It, it, it went from, uh, from Kahului all the way to Lahaina, and there was no changes. In other words, you couldn't get out of the boat, and a new guy gets in this. Other. You stay in the boat, and you paddle for 20 miles, and you get it done, and it's top speed as much as, and as fast as you can. And right in the middle of that, with all the training, there was one new guy who had never done it before. And they say that the iron, that, that trip from Kahului Harbor all the way to Lahaina, and you can go and look on a, on a map, they say that, that that trip messes with your mind. 
I, I was a novice and in a boat, and I remember going there and getting ready to paddle, and I see everybody putting on gloves. And I'm thinking, what are you wearing gloves for? They go, oh, well, this is like, this is really a lot of paddling, and you don't want to wear gloves. You might get blisters. I actually had to go to the hospital for the blisters on my hands. The, the, the doctor said, what did you do? It's like third degree burns all the way through your palms. I mean, they broke and then they built and broke again. It's like two double or triple sets of blisters that just broke because there's no stopping unless you quit and ruin the team. This guy in this boat, they trained. I mean, they were just incredible athletes, but he had never done it before, and something broke on the inside of his head. He couldn't take it anymore. They tell the story about how they're paddling, and they're three-quarters of the way there. I mean, they're almost there, and he just starts hollering, I can't do it! I can't do it! I can't do it! And they're like, shut up and paddle! And he's like, I can't, I can't, I can't! And he just jumps out of the boat. Dude ain't going to be in my boat if I'm going to race the race. I don't want him. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? He quit. That's John Mark. What all, the, what all the preaching, what all the impartation, the spending time with Jesus didn't have the faith or something happened to cause him to turn and run. Wow. One early church father said, John Mark just turned and ran home to his mama. Yeah, Mark left Paul and Barnabas, and, and he went home. At a crucial moment, he left the team. Now in our reading here, they're about to take another missionary journey to go back and visit the churches that they planted to see how everything's going. And as they go back, there is this discussion about bringing the guy who jumped out of the boat. Let's bring the guy who jumped out of the boat. He's my nephew the son of encouragement, Barnabas. Praise God for the Barnabas. you got to have a Barnabas in your life. Somebody that believes in you that you can do it. And Paul's like, there's no way. He jumped out of the boat, and we're not putting him back in the boat again. And they said, no, 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 he can do it. He said, no. And there's this sharp, biblical proportion argument. And God uses that argument really to now send off two teams, not just one. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark. We're writing your notes. There's this dispute between Paul and Barnabas over Mark. Barnabas wanted to take Mark again. Paul refused because of the desertion. Paul and Barnabas split company, stopped working together. And what's amazing to me is that this new missionary team has developed with Barnabas and Mark. And then we read 2 Timothy, who's written by, you know, the, Paul, writing to Timothy, and who's he ask for? He asks for John Mark, Beauty and the Beast. Something happened to the yellow belly sapsucker to turn him into somebody who's so on fire that Paul wanted him to come. What happened? He got changed. He got transformed. Mark is restored. Mark is with Paul when he's in prison and he wrote the letter to Colossians. Colossians 4.10. Mark is with him there. You see that. Paul mentions Mark as a fellow laborer in his letter to Philemon. Philemon, verse 24. There's only one chapter. In the final season of Paul's life, he asks for Mark to be brought to him because he's very useful. God is the one who transformed him. First of all, let's look, as I believe God's speaking to us through a number of things. How could such a sharp dispute happen between two men of God? I've actually had people say, well, do you think they were backslidden? What do you, what do you, how could that be such a sharp argument? But was anybody in sin? I mean, no, there's nobody in sin. How could two arguments happen between two men of God or two women of God? Easy. Simple. It's called a disagreement. We all have different gifts. Sometimes my gifts are kind of irritating for some. I have some friends of mine that just have tremendous gifts of mercy and compassion. I, I don't have that so much. I, I mean, I, I do, I do, but sometimes I don't. 
Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm like, wah, wah. That's more like me. That's, that's me. I have a gift of zeal. And I have a gift of judgment. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> You're like, that's, yeah, that's what my mom's got. That's what my, that's what my auntie has. She's got a gift. That's what my father had a gift. No. We all have different gifts. And, and I think that we need to be sensitive to the fact that we have different gifts and allow for those gifts to, to be used. And Paul was, perhaps he was set in his ways. Then again, perhaps the Lord said it like that in his own mind and heart so there would be another team that was developed. Listen, God can use obstacles and problems to expand his kingdom. And just because you're in the middle of some controversy or some tension, just keep your heart right and trust God to work it all for good. And keep, listen, don't violate your own convictions. Don't violate your own, Paul didn't violate his convictions, but you know what? Neither did Barnabas. And as a result, the kingdom of God went forward. I think we need to be very sensitive and understanding that we all have different gifts and to allow for each person to be them. God's not trying to make you into some robot. God's not, God doesn't want you to just be some, some you know, poured in jello mold and just conform and be a yes man or a yes woman. He wants you to be yes to him. But you, as you grow in God, and which is really bringing us to the next point, we're all at different levels of maturity. Listen, we're all at different levels of maturity. All of us. How many of you are still growing up in the Lord? Better raise your hand. Yeah. Thank God we're not what we used to be. And thank God He's not done with us. And every day is is God is at work in your life to make you more like Him. Paul and Barnabas had a sharp disagreement. Paul's driven. He was driven. Thank God he was driven. Because if he wasn't driven like he was, then then all the churches that were planted, perhaps they wouldn't have been planted. I mean, he would smash open regions. Do you know some people are built like that to smash open stuff? They're not so fun to be around sometimes. They're all at different levels of maturity. Mark's level was quite immature to to abandon the team and to leave. And and there's very possibly a difference between Paul and Barnabas. Paul ended up leading a team, but didn't start that way. Listen, it didn't start that way. See, Paul, Paul was discipled and then led really by Barnabas. It's not until that moment in Acts 12, Acts 13, where Bar Jesus steps up and does his demonic thing, and then Paul, it was that, that whole trip was really led by Barnabas, but there seems to be a shift right then where Paul is now the guy. There's a maturing that takes place in the life of a believer. There has to be a maturing. And it could be that Paul was immature but then began to grow and then because of his gifts led out as opposed to Barnabas. But, but understand that we're all at different levels of maturity and you don't know what the person next to you has gone through. And, and not everybody understands what you've been through or what you're going through today. We all have different personalities and backgrounds. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, we all have different personalities. Go ahead and tell them. Barnabas in Jerusalem was seemingly was seemingly wealthy. Paul was discipled by Gamil. In C.S. Lewis' books, book on mere Christianity, he, he, he begins to describe how many perceive how people perceive what a Christian should be. By the way, mere Christianity should be read by every single person here. It's, it's not a light read. It'll, it'll, help you to, it'll help you to think critically. There's so many people that do not think critically, and in this day of fake news, if I can go ahead and throw that out, in this day when there's so much information and so much going out there, you need to learn to, learn to think critically. Just because it's on someone's Facebook doesn't mean it's true. Just because it was on a Twitter feed doesn't mean it's true. 
You need to learn to think critically. But we all have different personalities and different backgrounds. And as a result of those personalities and backgrounds, we have a tendency to behave differently. Thank God. Thank God we behave differently. I thank God my wife's not like me. That would be horrible. What a nightmare that would be. I think she would say the same about me. We're unique. We're divinely created by God. But there are some aspects of, our, of who we are that need to change. You beast, you. We all need to be transformed right there in your notes. We all need to be transformed. So what's God up to? This is a part of the series that we're preaching on preparing for the in-gathering. You see, where we are as a people, as a a group of people, as a church, is not where we used to be five years ago. There's a maturing of leadership. There's a a, a growth that's taking place. And through the transformation of people, it's like a poster board to a community or to a family. You see, when somebody sees, uh, when a family sees someone get saved, healed, delivered, filled with the Spirit, filled with boldness, and begin to overcome their their challenges, their weaknesses, their life-controlling problems. They begin to get transformed into someone who can stand, a person who character, who doesn't jump out of the boat. When a family sees that, they say, dude, there must be something about whatever you're doing. I thought it was a cult. Those people are way too happy over there. But, But there's something, there's some good fruit here. I mean, you couldn't hold a job, and now you've had the same job for years. And you're getting promoted. And you'd fly off the handle and want to just hit people. And now you're turning the other cheek. I mean, what's what's going on? You're being transformed. God desires to conform us to his image. Let me give you some scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. And just as we have borne the likeness of earthly man, so we shall bear the likeness of the man from heaven, talking about Jesus. All the pressure, all the trials, all the difficulty, all the blessings, all the outpouring, all the infillings, it works in you to make you, to form you, to fashion you to be more like Jesus. Romans 8, 29. For those gone foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. To what? To be conformed to the likeness of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God wants to make you like Jesus. In your attitudes, in your actions, in your behavior, in your emotions, in every aspect of your life. He wants to make you like Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's, there's freedom, there's liberty. I shared about that recently. It's where the Holy Spirit is allowed to be Lord. Then there comes freedom. See, you can teach people And that's not what the Holy Spirit wants to do at times. I had somebody say to me, so pastor, isn't it the word that has preeminence? And the answer to that is absolutely not. The Holy Spirit has preeminence in services, in in gatherings, in corporate gatherings. The Holy Spirit has preeminence. The Holy Spirit. We want the Holy Spirit to come. Do you understand? You need to learn. You need to study. You need to show yourself a workman approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. You need to learn line upon line, precept upon precept. You need to to grow in the knowledge of God. need to grow in those things. Yes, you can't dismiss that. But when it comes to services and gatherings, it's the Holy Spirit has to be Lord. Listen, the only reason I'm continuing to preach the same message, which could change 30 seconds from now, is because that's what I feel moved along to do. I've stepped aside from that, and I'm sort of leaning on this a little bit. Because you can be taught, so you can be taught so much, you will end up dry. Listen, if all you do is have the word, you're gonna dry up. And if all you do is have the spirit, you will blow up. Does anybody know someone that's blown up? You know, there's Shondai and Shuba herking, jerking everywhere. Got to get their feet aren't on the ground. Can't, they're jumping out of the boat left and right and saying the Lord told them to do it. 
You, you following me? I'm jumping out the bottom. Back to the outrigger illustration. Right? The guy, train, jumps out of the boat. So there's people that jump out the boat, ruin the race, ruin people's lives, and say, God told me to do it. You flake. You, you flaky thing. That's a, that's, a, that's a flake bag. Well, well, couldn't it have been the Lord? It could have been. But when you're using that all every excuse and you've got wreckage behind you and you've got fruit that doesn't last, then that's not God, it's you. Making some lame excuse. Because you need to grow up. Look at your neighbor and says, he's not talking to me. He must be talking to somebody else. We don't have to agree. Come on, we all need to mature. We all need to grow up. And God's trying to form us into his image to be like him. Well, hallelujah. Being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord. Wow. I'm going to read that again. 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, who are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is spirit. All right, let's look at the next point. God desires us to be blameless before him. So when you stand before him, you hear, well done, good and, good and faithful servant. How many of you want to hear that? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You don't want to hear, well, what happened? I gave you my spirit. I gave you my void. I gave you everything. What happened? I mean, no, God's Jewish. Funny thing, I have, I have a very close friend who's a Jew, and uh, I was horsing around and, uh, and used that, you know, talk like that. I'm from the East Coast. And uh, sometimes you hear Jews talking like that. <laughs> so I, you know, was making my joke of the father talking like that. They got so mad at me. They said, you're talking like some uneducated Jew that God's like some uneducated jerk. You should never say it like that. That's not how he is. <laughs> I said, oh, <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> I got straight rebuked. Anyway, still makes for good preaching. How many of you hear, well done? You don't want to hear, well, what happened? First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.8. Actually, what did she, they said, you sound like some kind of a schmuck. I, I don't know what a schmuck is. Is that bad? Oh, forgive me. Amen. Let's move on. doesn't sound very good, does it? Uh, I'm not looking at my mother right now. That'll help me. Praise God. <laughs> First Corinthians 1.8. <laughs> he will keep you strong to the end <laughs> so that you will be blameless. Perfect. Awesome. So that you will be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus. God wants you to be blameless. Come on, somebody say, God wants me to be blameless. That's above reproach. That means nobody can say anything bad about you. Nobody can say, oh yeah, that's the guy that jumped out of the boat. God wants you to mature so that when you start something, you finish it. When you say, this is I'm going to do it, then you do it. When you say you're going to be on time, you're on time. When you shake your hand and you say, I give you my word, that you actually do it, even when it costs you a lot. Your word is your bond. You ever heard that? We don't use that terminology anymore. But for the Christian, there really shouldn't have to have contracts. But we do. And, and listen, let me just tell you, you're doing business with another Christian, especially, you should have a contract. What? What do you mean by especially? I have seen more believers, gut believers, over and over, and they say, well, that's not what I said. I said this. You're like, no way, bro. Oh, yeah. And then it's just this big argument. Listen, put it in writing so nobody just gets wounded and hurt. And there's misunderstandings. And the devil twists words. How many of you know that? And sometimes we hear what we want to hear. And you'll be like, oh, he'll just forgive me. Yeah. And you'll stand before the judgment. And you're here. Well, what happened? <laughs> All right. Let's move on. Our, our life is to bring glory to the Lord. Matthew 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. 
A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. God wants to use you to bring light into the world. Not darkness. He wants to use you to bring blessing. Not curses. He wants to use you to bring goodness. Not badness. He wants to use you to touch and to change your community, your family. He wants you to be a light in an evil world. And I'm encouraged that the Lord will transform us. See, knowing that that God transforms us, what are we supposed to do? So if that's the intention of God, to make us more like Him. Come on, I'm teaching you a little bit. Pastoring you a little bit. Telling you to grow up. If God's intention is to transform us, what are we supposed to do? Well, the first thing is, is is we must be quick to repent. Live a a lifestyle of repentance. Be quick to repent. Live a lifestyle of repentance. I had to repent today a number of times. For what? Nothing major, but you know how many of you know small things are major things too? If you haven't repented today, maybe you should do it now. We've got to be open for God to reveal our shortcomings. Oh, I hate that, but I like it. See, what if God was to send you somebody to correct you and spare you from heartache and pain, but you can't hear them because, because of your own pride or your spiritual wax in your ears? What if God was to send somebody to correct you, but you just, you know, who are they? My kids have been mightily used in correcting me, even at a young age. Listen, God God can use anybody, whether they're they're educated or uneducated, whether it be older or younger or really young. Out of the mouths of babes, he's ordained his praise. Listen, be open to being corrected by anything and anybody. Very good. I'm going to go over on this side, talk to this. (laughs) Be open to being corrected. Be, Be open to being corrected and having the Lord reveal to you your shortcomings. Listen, one of the biggest blessings in my life in recent years, I mean, I, there was a question at the women's, uh, the women's conference that we had, the hotel there. You know, what's the, what's the greatest touch from the Lord or what's the greatest thing the Lord's ever done for you or encounter you've ever had? That's almost, it's nearly impossible to answer when I think back. And, and sh- our lives should be that way. And yet we, there's greater things that are yet to come. Be open to the Lord putting his finger on things. You know, ho- when people that live holy will run to the light. You don't run away from it. Don't run like Adam ran and tried to make some fig leaves. Fig leaves don't work. Your, your method of righteousness doesn't work. So you run to the Lord with all your ugliness and warts and everything. You come. The beast. You come to the Lord and he transforms you from being a beast. We're all like that. <laughs> And he can touch you and you can be set free. Be open to God putting his finger on that attitude, that problem, that pride. Come on, that prejudice you have, the shortcoming of always quitting, not keeping your word, using your anger to manipulate people. You witchcraft thing. That's witchcraft. You use anger to get people to do what you want. That's not right. God doesn't do that. Consequences is what he uses. I started to say that one of the greatest blessings I had in my life it was so I had to put to death a real hope and a dream and a prophetic word I had, but the timing wasn't right. And as I was moving towards that, the Lord said, no. So it's this thing that's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet. And it's a, but in the timing, 
look like it could happen the next week. Do you understand? I'm being vague on purpose. And so in my heart, I'm like, dude, this is it. I've got like tapes and this is the word and it's going to happen this week, next week. It's going to happen. And the Lord's like, no, it's not. I'm like what? Yeah, no, you're not going. It's not happening. I'm like, Lord, really? He's like, yeah, really? You're not ready. You've got issues. Dude, I'm just talking about a couple years ago. <laughs> it's not like when I first got saved. I'm telling you, you have issues. We all have issues. And if you're not open to God putting his finger on those things, then you will end up being an immature, stuck believer going around the mountain wondering where your elevation is. And you've just been crotchety and crabby and angry and God's trying to heal you and set you free, but you're not willing to let him, you're not willing to let him put his finger on that thing. I'm trying to help you. Be open to have him putting his finger on your shortcomings. And, and when he sends you somebody, don't kill the messenger. There was a period in my life when I was a bachelor, didn't have the greatest hygiene. Hygiene. Hi. Hygiene. What's up? No, hygiene. I didn't have the greatest practices. And as a result, what you all laughing at over there, huh? <laughs> yeah, praise the Lord. As a result, my mama taught me, right? Amen? But I neglected to follow through on my teaching that I received from my mother. And so as a result, I kind of Got away from deodorant. Can you come and play the piano and help me out a little bit? I'm almost done. I kind of got away from deodorant, and I, and I kind of, you know, you know, I didn't brush my teeth all that much. I was going to church, and, you know, I, I, you know, I, got, I got a lot of teeth. You know what I mean? I got, like, horse teeth or whatever. You get one of those smiles. So... You know, I was saved, and I'm still smiling like this. The only problem is, I had all kinds of stuff in there. It's really sick. I came over, I came over to my brother. We were talking. So proud of you and what's going on in the Eagle River, praise God. We were talking and having a moment of mentoring right before service. Uh, thank you. That's really helping me. And um, just before we got up to pray for people, he appears to the front with an open canister of breath mints. He's like, take two. That's the love of God right there. He loves you, in fact. Because if you were up there for prayer and I breathed on you, you might have fallen out for other reasons. You know what I'm talking about. You know, pride is like bad breath. You're usually the last person to know you have it. But I thank God for people that came and said, hey, uh, hey, uh, Daniel. I'm like, yeah. He's like, yeah, God's good, man. I'm like, yeah. He's like, yeah, dude. You need to brush your teeth because your gums, I think you've got gingivitis. You know, the, do your gums hurt? You know, it's like a dent. You know, some there's teeth people. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? They're like into it, these teeth people. And they're like, you know, your, your gums are probably sore and they hurt. I'm like, you need to brush your teeth because it's really, it's, it's, you got to brush your teeth. I'm like, oh yeah, my mama taught me about that. I could have gotten angry. How dare they talk to me about my... Listen, some of you got some shortcomings, some stuff. You should, you should pray that God sends you people to speak into that ugly thing that you have. You know, if I... Do you know, Mama? <laughs> if I didn't get back to brushing my teeth, and by the way, I started wearing deodorant. 
long acting. I don't think I ever would have been able to, to hook Karen, praise the Lord. I think she'd have run the other way. She said, this man's ugly. He smells. Come on, Pastor Karen, give me an amen. Praise God. She's online. I'm almost done. Oh, look at the second to last point. Be patient with people. Love people. By the way, telling them they should brush their teeth is not the first thing you should tell them when they're walking in the church. All the greeters, ushers. Don't, try, don't, 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 be, the, don't be the fourth part of the Trinity. Tell people what they should wear. Tell people how they should comb their hair. Listen, that, that, that correction of my teeth and deodorant did not come until somebody built a relationship with me. I kind of wondered why they didn't tell some other people I knew that didn't brush their teeth. But, but they developed a relationship with me. They loved, I knew that they loved me. We had spent time together. And then they said, dude, you ain't ever going to get a girl if you don't brush your teeth. No, they didn't. Do you understand? They didn't say that. But it was true. Unless you, you know, get somebody that doesn't brush your teeth either and you can be the toothless, brushless people the rest of your life. And maybe that's okay. It's not good for you. Dental bills are really high. Dentists are expensive. I've dug a big ditch. I need somebody to help me get out of it. Praise the Lord. If you're offended, just call Pastor Alex. His number is 907. Everybody say, be patient. And not so quick to judge others. Quit pointing the finger. You point the finger at people, you'll find that the three are coming back right at you. How about you be like Jesus? How about you take a look at your behavior? Sometimes, sometimes in Christian circles, people have a dream and it's always about somebody else. Let me, let me just tell you, dream one-on-one. One-on-one dreams. The dream you had, it's about you first. First. You apply it to your life first. Then you can look outside of that. Some people think they have the gift of discernment and they really they have the gift of suspicion. How about love people? How about serve them? How about go the extra mile? How about bless them? How about put a 20 in their hand or a 50 in their hand and bless them? How about, how about pray for them? How about, how about pick them up or give them a ride or take them out to lunch or take them out to dinner instead of being so critical? Be patient. Be patient with people, especially yourself. Be patient. Be kind. Be forgiving. And believe that God will transform you and others. So don't stop praying. Don't stop praying and serving the Lord. Listen, if your life is still broken and you've been serving the Lord for years, don't quit. It didn't take you six months to get in the ditch that you're in. Come on, serve Him. Love Him. Yet at the same time, you look at your life and you don't see kind of the transformation that you see in others maybe or what you see in Scripture, then maybe you should take a look at what you're doing. I've had so many people that said, well, I want to serve the Lord in smoke pot. It works for me. Yeah, I've never seen it work for anybody. You, you, can't, you can't love the Lord and continue in your sin. You'll just end up a pile of a, a mess. But God can transform you from the beast to the beauty. I see some beauties out there. Stand up on your feet. Come on. Come on, lift your hands and ask God to transform you. There's going to be any great in gathering. One of the keys of that is us maturing, us growing, becoming more like Him. Lord, you can take a John Mark who jumped out of the boat, turned heel and ran like a yellow belly sap sucker, and you can turn him into John Mark who wrote the book of Mark and was called on by the Apostle Paul at the end of his life because he was very useful. Lord, you transformed that young man and you can transform us.
And God, we ask you to do it right now. Lord, I pray that you would reveal unto us shortcomings, places of immaturity. Come on, ask God. That's a great prayer. Ask God to show you where you all jacked up. Ask Him. Lord, show us that we might change, that we might be conformed into your image. God, right now, Listen, the altar of God is where the sinfulness of man meets the holiness of God. Throughout Scripture, we call this an altar. I'm going to tell you something. Whatever you have going on in your life, if you'll learn to throw yourself into the loving arms of Jesus, learn to throw yourself on the mercy seat, learn to throw yourself unto God and yield to Him and ask Him to change you. I have found what's happened at altars has even been more effective than any preaching that I listen to. You see, there's signs follow the preaching of the Word. We're going to sing this again as we do. You feel the Holy Spirit touching you and helping you. Maybe you know what some of the shortcomings are and you want to get rid of it. Maybe you're not sure, but you just want to become more like Jesus. Wherever you fit in the category of this message, position yourself at the altar of God right now. Now, he died so you don't have to, but the resurrection power is available for you. Come to the altar. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the bread. Holy Spirit, come. Jesus Christ, oh, come to the altar. Forgive us for our shortcomings. We want to mature. We want to be more like you. Holy Spirit. decision to live for Jesus. You've never given your heart to God. Don't you leave this place without being reconciled to Him. There truly is a hell that's to be shunned and the heaven that's to be gained. But you must repent. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. 
For there's no other name given among men by which you must be saved. The name of Jesus. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father. It's a free gift that no man would boast. Eternal life given to you, given to me. It's too many, it's too as many as believed in him, he gave them the right to become children of God. Born again. You must be born again. If you can't remember when you've been born again, then you probably weren't. You must be born again. There's a decision that you've got to come to where you, you see your sin and you realize it's your sin that crucified Jesus. Listen, I'm not here to play some religious game. I don't like religious games. There really is a place called hell and there really is life abundant for you here in the earth, in the midst of this place. He became poor that we might become rich. He stepped out of time, stepped out of eternity into t time and space, put on robes of flesh, which I don't think any of us could really understand how horrible that would be for God to do that. Fully God, fully man. Walk the earth in accordance with the scriptures, fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies. Emmanuel, God with us, pierced for our transgressions, wounded for our iniquity. Ch Isaiah chapter 53. Though our sins be as like crimson, like, like blood, he'll make them as white as snow. That's what they were telling that pro-council and bar Jesus tried to distort the things of God and judgment came upon him. Don't let anybody distort you from this simple truth that Jesus loves you, died on a cross, rose again from the grave. In your place he died. Receive the free gift. That's the simple gospel. Be born again. You must be born again. Anything else added to the simplicity of what the cross, the crucifixion and resurrection is? It's not of God. It is that simple. If you're here, you want to give your heart to Jesus, those online, every head bowed, every eye closed, service is almost over, you want to give your heart to Jesus for the first time, or you need to make a recommitment because you know you're not walking with Him tonight, and you need to recommit your life to the Lord. Or maybe the devil just lies to you, and you want to be sure. You want to be sure that when you die, when that day comes, which no man knows, but when it does come to all of us, when it comes for you, you'll find yourself in heaven. You want to be sure of that. If that's you, give your heart to Jesus for the first time. Secondly, make a recommitment because you drifted. You're not walking with the Lord. You've got compromise in your life and you want to come back to Christ. Or number three, you just want to be sure of your salvation. Everybody praying all across this place. If that's you, lift your hand to the count of three. One, two, three. Do it now. Lift your hand high. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Praise God. God bless you. Anybody else? Pray with me, won't you? Just write out loud. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in my place, to rise again from the grave for me. Forgive me for all of my sin. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Wash me. Cleanse me. Make me new. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Let me pray for you. Holy Spirit, I pray touch these. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Be filled right now. The Holy Spirit, the power of the resurrection, fill these now in Jesus' name. And God, we pray, transform them, transform us. Come on, ask God to do that for you. Lord, transform me. Transform us, God, to be more like you. So that we could see that in gathering. We would not bring reproach. We would be above reproach. We would be blameless. And those that are on looking would see the transformation and be drawn to a relationship with you. Expose anything in our lives that grieves you. That we would live a lifestyle of repentance day in, day out. And in the end, we would hear, well done as you've conformed us into your, into your image. And we thank you and we praise you. Come on, let's sing it one more time. In Jesus' name. What a Savior is in you wonderful. Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Holy Spirit.
Everyone here should have an altar in their life. I can make one in my car, in my bathroom, in my living room while I'm lying on my bed. I, am, I have a walking mobile altar. It's my heart. You can bring your heart before the Lord. You don't have to have any music. You don't have to have powerful Pastor Alex leading worship. Praise God for all of that. Praise God. But you need to have an altar. You need to learn to bring your kids to an altar in your home. You need to have a place where you're having time with God daily, daily time with Him. And come to that place as often as you want to. And let me say this. As fast as you're willing to die to yourself is as fast as you'll be transformed. We always got one part that's just trying to kick and stay alive. Come and die to your flesh, die to yourself, and receive power to live a life, life abundant. Don't, don't make fig leaves. Run to him. Run to him. Let him clothe you. Let him, let him, let him clothe you in his righteousness. Don't, don't try to do it on your own. Praise God for, for people that will love you enough to tell you that you've got to brush your teeth. If that was a word for you tonight, amen. If that's a word for you, you need to wear deodorant, amen. Everyone needs to wear deodorant. Praise God. Didn't get too many amens on that one. We should probably close. How I many you know taking showers is good in this modern day and age? Great, all five of you. Glory to God. There are times where there might not be a shower, but you understand. It's a spiritual principle. Come on, Lord. Transform us. Come on, say it one more time. Lord transform me. Make it personal one more time. Lord, transform me. Father, thank you for what you've done tonight. Bless your people. Cause your face to shine upon us. Lift up your countenance towards us. Be gracious to us. Keep us. Give us peace in Jesus' holy name. Amen.